Matt Ibrahim, welcome back to the Soccer Queens podcast. Thanks for having me back, Eric. I appreciate it. This is, you know, I when you said podcast number two, I was like, wait, that's right. We did an episode. It was last fall, I believe, fall of 2022. So it's, and I was in a different building. So it's, this is nice to be on again. Thank you. Yes, the last episode you did was on deceleration, change of direction, and agility, which I will link below if you guys missed that. Today is going to be a totally different topic, and actually one I shockingly haven't talked about on this podcast before, at least in an in-depth episode. We are going to dive into everything hamstrings. So for soccer players within the men's game, at least there's been a lot of hamstring injuries. And I've talked to a lot of my colleagues who work in the pros and in college, and they're saying now in 2024, there's more hamstring injuries than ever before. Yet we have all this technology, all these sports scientists. So I'm really curious to ask your opinion on what's going on and how to reduce the the risk of hamstring injuries. And then in the women's game, we're seeing more ACL tears, but the hamstrings do play a role in mitigating those. So this is a super, super important episode for everyone. And I guess, Matt, just start off with um, just reminding everyone what you do and who you work with. Yeah, uh, great question. So I'm I'm pumped to jump in. So for me, in my career, I've worked with um, clients, athletes, so high school level, mostly high school and college level within the sports of soccer and basketball. Right now here at the college, I more work in a consulting role where I kind of, um, you know, I'll, I'll volunteer my time as a coach in a weight room with the soccer players, the basketball players, and some football. But thinking the, those multi-directional sport athletes, so like soccer, where you're having to sprint, slow down, and change directions all the time. So that's what I'm doing here at, at Endicott College uh, in Beverly, Mass. Awesome. So let's jump in. I want you to just kind of break it down for us. What is the function of the hamstrings and why do we need strong hamstrings for reducing injury risk and also improving performance? To to simplify it, people forget that. So the hamstrings can be trained a few different ways. So think of when your knee bends, like knee flexion, think of when your hip extends or you bring your leg back and then think of like combined knee flexion and hip extension. So more often than not, Erica, when people are training the hamstrings, they're often doing only one of those three boxes, which is great. I'm glad you're doing something. But if you're not uh, checking off all three boxes, so knee flexion, hip extension, and combined knee flexion slash hip extension, I think we're not turning over all of the stones we could for putting our athletes in a great position to succeed on the pitch. So can you just give some examples of exercises? What's a knee flexion, hamstring exercise, Mm -hmm. and a hip extension? Absolutely, yeah. So think of, so knee flexion or knee bending. So if you were flat on your back, so some will call this supine, right? So you're flat on your back on the ground, and your legs are long, and you have two slider discs or movement sliders underneath your heels. And all you're going to do is you're going to pick your hips up, and you're going to curl or bend your knees, bring your heels toward your butt, and extend them out. That would be an example of a knee flexion-based exercise where you're using the hamstrings. Now, if I'm standing up and I have dumbbells in front of my hands, but they're tight to my body, meaning they're not going to drift away from me, I'm just going to shoot my hips back toward the wall behind me, keep a soft knee bend. So most of the uh, the motions occurring in my hips, like a hip hinge or hip extension, I'm going to drift those dumbbells down to the front of my like middle, middle of my shin below the kneecap, and then stand back up. That would be a hip extension based variation. When it comes to combined hip extension and knee flexion, uh, people can be pretty creative. So the some variations that could work in this position would be any sort of like Nordic hamstring, especially if you're doing like an eccentric lowering component. To give an example of that, um, if you're in a position where your two knees are two knees are down on the ground or on on a, on a pad or what's called the Nordic bench and your ankles are locked into position, they're stable, they're not gonna move. From here, technically you're already in a fixed knee flexion position or knee bend position, and then you're going to be lowering back down. Whereas you could also do what's called a razor curl, where you get hip flexion and extension with the knee flexion. So I know it's a lot of, a lot of talking about movements. We're gonna show uh, some videos later about a bunch of different examples. Most important thing, 
is I would recommend including all three var all three variations at some point in your training program with your soccer players. So why do soccer players need to have strong hamstrings for injury reduction first and foremost? Think of the hamstrings as the major conductors of the lower body. So we know that soccer players need to sprint, so then they go fast. We know that they need to slow down fast and they need to change directions fast. Think of that as like the, the continuum of acceleration, deceleration or reacceleration. I think I've heard that from Lee Taft, like that continuum. Sprint, slow down, change directions. So I always think of the hamstrings as the conductor of the lower body, like in that process. So change the direction and sprinting. So if they're being used at a really heavy, heavy rate at a high volume, they're being used in the sport. We should probably prepare them for the high utilization in the sport. The best way we can do that is in training, whether it's weight room, the fitness center, strength training, rehab, like whatever, as long as we prepare them for the sport. I always liken this to if we're not physically preparing our athletes for th the demands needed and required in the sport that they're going to play, we're leaving some meat on the bone. We have to think of what are all the physical qualities needed in the specific sport. And this goes back to just doing your, your needs analysis. Like what are the bioenergetic demands, the biomechanical demands, and common injuries associated, common injury risk associated with the sport. When you think of soccer, it's multidirectional, it's sprint, stop, uh, reaccelerate. And it's, there's endurance, but there's also repeat, uh, repeat sprint ability and power ability. In all of those, the hamstrings are heavily, heavily used. To me, it says, hey, we should definitely train it. Now for ACL injuries, how does a strong hamstring help with the, the knee stabilization? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So there's a lot of good information out there and research on like people will look at when someone is um, doing ACL rehab, like return to sport, return to play. A lot of um, good medical providers will look at the hamstring to quad ratios, making sure that those are a certain number. I'm not knowledgeable of the exact number. I don't work in the medical world, but I know it, I know it's, it's an important component. The other thing is thinking if, if, if certain individuals are more anterior, lower body dominant, more quad dominant, they're not able to utilize the hamstrings like they will need to be used from a functional standpoint in sprinting, stopping, slowing down, changing directions. Having really strong functional hamstrings that are both flexible and have uh, mobility in the hip joint is really crucial for the hamstrings to be able to be as powerful and explosive as possible, both for force production as well as force absorption. You knew I was going to call back to deceleration stuff. So the way that I think about it and look at it is there's when everyone says when someone says hey we need you to have good flexibility good mobility what does that actually mean it has to be it has to be mirror to what the demands are what are you going to be using it for if you're going to be is that a cat or a dog in the background <laughs> hello we actually here she is hello. everyone <laughs> what, 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 what's her name bella hey bella so <laughs> she always um, joins as a co-host, but she's pretty quiet, I, I which is it. nice. <laughs> I love dogs. I love dogs. So the way I think of it is if we're going to be using the hamstrings at a high volume, let's focus on training it in such a way that's going to allow us to do that. And so when we think about flexibility, mobility, it all, it all depends on well, how much will you need? If you're a gymnast, well, you're, you're going to need like the most hamstring tissue flexibility and most hip joint mobility that you you can you can access. If you're a soccer player, you don't necessarily need to palm the floor. You need to have enough hamstring flexibility in the muscle, enough joint mobility in the hip joint to be able to sprint, jump, land, cut, change directions without any limitation. What what does that actually mean? Well, this is when we'd have to run th throw someone through like a needs analysis, a battery an assessment, a battery of tests, and then have them perform um, exercises and see how they fare. Um, I know a lot of good, like high performance division one collegiate to division two collegiate and then pro sports will use like Nordboard for hamstring testing, but the Nordic hamstring eccentric lowering, what they're likely looking at is um, their eccentric rate of force development and how well they can produce, uh, absorb that force. Um, and they're probably uh, looking at like kind of movement jump for uh, uh, rate of force development, but also um, they may, may even be looking at isometric mid thigh pull for reactive strength index, all fancy terms and acronyms, but that can tie back into what the hamstrings are capable of doing from a quality standpoint on, on the soccer field. 
So let's get into the flexibility discussion because I wrestle with this one a lot. But <laughs> a couple of years ago, I had a high school girl come to me and she had no background in strength training and she couldn't touch her toes. And we trained for several months. We didn't do any stretching, really. We just did RDLs, heel walkouts, stability ball curls, all the hamstring movements that you just discussed earlier. And after several months, she was able to touch her toes with ease. So explain that. And why do we not always need so much stretching? And is it a flexibility issue or are the hamstrings just weak? Yeah, so the way that's a great question, and this comes up a lot, especially with uh, individuals who may not have been educated properly or given the proper information. So I'm glad we're, we're covering this. So the way I think about it, it's like, so we know that the science tells us right now, the research says neuromuscular adaptations or how quickly the nervous system and, and the muscular systems adapt to a certain stimulus, it's between two and eight weeks, which is, a, I'm sorry, two and 12 weeks, which is a really wide open uh, period of time. I think of that as as like okay, let's let's somewhere between six weeks. Your nervous system and muscular muscular system will adapt to whatever you're throwing at, whatever exercise or whatever you're training. In that process, you'll develop more motor control or ability to control the range of motion that you're working out in. So when when folks will just perform mobility drills, flexibility drills, recovery drills, yoga drills, stretching drills, these are all incredible. If they feel good, by all means, do it. However, if you're not combining those type of drills with strength training and resistance and load, so think lengthen un under tension, like le lengthen while we're loading, we're not going to have the adaptation. We're not going to acquire that new range of motion. It's a very short-term, acute time. So I'll give a visual. So let's say someone comes in and says, oh, um, let's do a toe touch test, feet flat on the ground feet together, try to touch your toes. And they're like, oh, I can only get to my knee. Okay, now let, let's trick the nervous system. Inhale through your nose. At, at the same time as you try to touch your toes, blow out your 21st birthday candles as you exhale, try to go down. Oh, wow, I got further. Great. That's momentary. That will be there for maybe a minute or two. That increased range of motion, right? I'm putting air quotes up because it's just a temporary uh, range of motion increase. If you were to then, maybe you do... I don't know, 10 to 15 of those reps. Then you go load that exercise like, like an, a Romanian deadlift or an RDL with two dumbbells in front of your thighs. Let's say do a few sets of 10. You're likely will in, keep that, that, that range of motion you just acquired next day, next couple of days. And if you continue to train that every week, you will increase your range of motion. So I'm a firm believer. And if you're going to do mobility, flexibility drills, do strength, resistance, and loading as well, because together they're potent. Yeah, I'm glad you said that the combination is really potent because a lot of girls think that it is a lack of flexibility problem. So they're like, oh, I need to sign up for a yoga class or do mobility the whole session. And it's like, no, we got to load you. And RDLs are so great for that. And single leg RDLs as well. I mean, just getting through that full range of motion under control with the weight is it's so powerful for athletes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and, to, and to piggyback off of that, the thing that I always come to as well, I think a lot of people will overcomplicate the process, right? And I'm also like, hey, like take a 10,000 foot bird's eye view. What is, when you watch the sport of soccer, for example, right? What are, what are you seeing the players doing? Well, they're kicking, they're passing, they're doing a header, they're changing direction, they're sprinting, they're stopping, they're, they might be backpedaling, lateral shuffling. Okay. Any of those positions, and I know there's millions of more, but those are the ones that use at high volumes. Are any of them doing a split at any, at any given time? Like, I'm sure at one point or another, if someone gets, gets crossed up, they might fall into a split in soccer. But 99.9% of the time, how often is someone doing a split, Like, which requires a ton of hip joint mobility, a ton of hamstring flexibility? So then ask yourself, well, is this a quality that I'm going to prioritize in training? Probably not, because I'm not going to be in that position. I always try to have that like common sense, logical approach to like, hey, like, what are they going to need? If I'm a power lifter, for example, and I know, you know, it's, not, it's completely different than soccer, I probably don't need to be doing a split. I probably need to be as stiff and rigid and, and, and have as much tension as possible to be able to move a heavy, heavy load. So I always think like, hey, what are the positions you see them in? So. 
if you don't mind, can we maybe screen share some exercises yeah. for those watching on video? I mean, yeah. I mainly post these podcasts on YouTube for a reason. <laughs> so you guys Absolutely. got us on video. <laughs> See but my it's just... beautiful background here. <laughs> Love it. So while uh, Matt pulls this up, I just want to give you guys some ideas of some of the movements we should be prioritizing pretty much year round. Um, soccer players should be also training within the season one to two times a week so that their strength doesn't wither away and they're able to tolerate the load within their games and practices. So yeah, I'm excited to see these. Uh, I know you and I program pretty similar, but yeah, we just really keep it basic and just focus on the foundational hamstring movements. Yeah. So we'll, we'll, we'll watch a few of the videos and, and we'll kind of chat a little bit as well. So let me make sure this is not in the way. So this is just um, a little bit what we already talked about. And so this is an example of a, a knee flexion based or a hamstring curl. You could use, I'm using a roller here. I'm adding band resistance because I just, I wanted to make it harder, but a roller, uh, I think this is from Sornax. You can use two sl like two sliders or movement discs. You can use a physio ball. Some people call it a stability ball, exercise ball. You could even put your, your heels in the stirrups of a TRX. If you set it at standing knee height, that's usually about a good place to be. Um, you could also do this with a Dynamax or a large medicine ball, but keep in mind, whatever weight that medicine ball weighs, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, it's going to make it that much more challenging. So those are just some variations I've used over the years. Most common, put the two sliders on, uh, like this is red, so turf and just slide. Now, actually curling it is challenging. So more often than not, I'll start here. So I'm starting knees bent. I'm going to bridge up. I'm going to slowly lower for the eccentric or lengthening component only three to five seconds, rest, reset. That to me is, is a great starting position for most folks um, for this type of exercise. That could be a variation you could perform. And then um, uh, I do want to just, oh, sorry, sorry. In. Yeah. Please. With the, with the curl, I mean, there's so many modalities to mm -hmm. use. Um, I, during COVID, we all had to get really creative. So if you're working <laughs> from, yeah, if you're working from home remotely, use towels on the mm -hmm. wood floor in your house. <laughs> um, just put your feet under a towel and have at it. So there's ways to do it with different types of equipment. To even add to that, if you have, because it's a great, I'm glad you said that, uh, paper plates, I would advise like two or three per foot or heel on carpet surfaces or turf surfaces. So in home, probably carpet. Those work well. Um, like you said, like a towel on linoleum or like wooden floors work well. Like totally awesome ideas. I love that. The other thing, Erica, here is this. I'm just using two legs here. So bilateral. You could play around with single leg or unilateral variations. But again, I think the most important one starting out would be focusing on the eccentric or the lowering component where you're lengthening or you're getting your hamstring muscle long. So focusing on starting here extending out and then you would just rest one leg two i'm sorry two legs and one leg i think there's a lot of good value there um in terms of what that's going to transfer to for soccer so the next one and again these are just some examples like common examples i use this with all, a lot of my athletes this is an uh, a nordic hamstring oh, apologies i don't know how to rewind it it's gonna it's gonna fun funnel through here are just some examples. This one often gets looked at as like that's that that's a you know old school bodybuilding, but I'll review. So these are just some examples. Here's the one you saw earlier, the knee flexion hip extension one. Then it's going to go back into so here's a, a Nordic variation where I'm just focusing on the eccentric component. I did the, I did the concentric there, but certainly you don't have to if you're working in sport. This is a physio ball variation. So just some different variations of curls, Nordic eccentric lowering, um, standing hip hinging prone hamstring curls, so face down hamstring curls. We've been doing, I've been showing you the one where your supine are facing up. I really think it's a nice way to challenge the muscle um, in, in a position where maybe athletes aren't, aren't as commonly challenged. If your gym doesn't have your old school, like, bo like bodybuilding, like seated, I'm sorry, prone or face down hamstring curl, that's okay. Go onto a bench, have the kneecaps off of the bench, not in contact, behind the feet, attach bands around an anchor point like a swat rack, and then curl the bands toward your butt. That could be a variation as well. You can also do partner assisted, partner assisted or partner resisted, and then assisted back down. I think you can be creative. What's most important in these videos 
is not the piece of equipment that I'm using. It's irrelevant. All of them are resistance. What is important is the positions that I'm in or the athlete that is in. That's the most important part. And just to recap, really focusing on lowering or eccentrics first and foremost, and then going full range of motion. Because when you go full range of motion, then we'll be increasing, like we talked about earlier, Eric, the joint mobility of the hip as well as the flexibility of the hamstring muscles. Can you go into the tempo of the exercise just a little bit further? So definitely on the eccentric portion where they're lengthening the legs or straightening the legs, really learn how to control that. But then eventually do you progress to like a powerful concentric where they're coming up really fast and really working on that explosiveness? For me, I always like to begin with isometric positions then increased eccentric positions, and then add in full range of motion, which of course loops in the concentric. In terms of how to program like time and retention, I always think about if I'm gonna ask an athlete to perform a five second eccentric or five second lowering, he or she's probably only gonna give me three seconds because eccentrics aren't fun. If I program a three second eccentric or three second lowering, he or she's probably only give me one, maybe one second, because again, it's not fun. So I'm thinking about that first and foremost, because eccentrics are hard, it's challenging, and it's not fun. Um, I also like to add positional isometrics. So for example, if we were doing an RDL, so where you're standing, two dumbbells are in front of your thighs, the video will, will funnel through again here. Maybe you add in a three-second lowering where your hips are shooting back and you're dropping your, your dumbbells down to the front of your thighs. And maybe when you get to your limit, your position where you're like, hey, this is the furthest I can go, while uh, keeping my spine in a good position. So right here, three to five seconds, pause. Once you're in your, your end range position, what is that for someone? It could be when you feel like your hamstrings are still having to work hard, maybe you add a one second isometric there and then you can slowly come back up. So maybe like a three second eccentric, a one second isometric at the bottom and a three second concentric. That's somewhere where you'd allow someone to adapt in that slow controlled format. Over time, if you want to, increase the speed or make it rapid for the eccentric or the concentric you certainly could and i think it's a great idea what you could do is let's say you do a three second eccentric and immediately like x or zero just shoot back up meaning there's no time spent there you just rapidly come back up for the shortening or concentric component you could also do the opposite which we'll get into next where you're rapidly eccentrically lowering and then you slow and control come back up think of if you're going to perform the eccentric or the lowering component rapidly or fast, you're improving your eccentric rate of force development. In layman's, your ability to slow down fast or land fast. Conversely, if you're focusing on a rapid concentric, or in this case, right now I'm gonna shoot, I'm gonna shoot on up into the concentric. If, if, if I did that fast, if you focus on that, or like the shortening of the muscle rapidly, then you're improving your rate of force development or how, how fast you can jump or how fast you can take off and sprint, like how fast you can produce power. So they're both really great. I would prefer to start with isometrics for the tendon health, then eccentrics, and then looping in concentric, so full range of motion, and then adding in rapid eccentric and or rapid concentric. Yeah, that's really great. Those uh, videos are really helpful. And there's just a lot of thought that goes into this. I'm sure people are like, wow, you guys are really nerding out on hamstrings. But <laughs> there's a, a lot of thought behind it. And also, this is why athletes do have to do this year round, because then we can't really make those tempo progressions mm -hmm. and get new adaptations that we want to get. So just going off of that, I, do you have any more videos or is that? Yeah, it? yeah, yeah, yeah. You have a few more? Uh, okay. If you have time, if you want to. So I have some. Yeah, some give a few more. Some rapid and then some intense stuff. So if you were to choose to focus on a fast eccentric or a fast lowering, this could be a variation. Now, this medicine ball, I think, is like 10, 12, 15 pounds. And this is your SLDL or single leg delt or one leg RDL. I'm not here to argue. They all the same thing, right? <laughs> uh, this could be a nice variation where you're rapidly throwing the ball down and having to catch it. But what's really happening is I'm quickly lowering or eccentrically um, uh, performing the exercise. This could be an exercise you could do. You could also do it with the band, the cable column. Um, I'm a huge fan, and we talked about it earlier, of the single leg deadlift, the one leg RDL. Huge fan from a balance, coordination, stability standpoint, but also when you think about sports, Think about just running. Roughly 60% of the time in running, 
you're on one leg, which this 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 funnels through the like whole like Alex Materia, Mike Boyle conversation of like, hey, single leg might be more important for sport. I think all of it's important, but single leg is definitely important for sport. The best variation for hamstring, in my opinion, is this type of exercise, the single leg deadlift or single leg RDL, because you're getting eccentrically lowering of the, the hamstring. Uh, and then I think so one of my favorites as well, there, there's just so many variations you can do with it, depending mm -hmm. on the, the training age of the athlete. It's, it's an amazing exercise. Absolutely. I just have one more if that's okay. And then I think this one is focusing more on, so I got this, um, I like this a lot. I got this from Mike Moon at Next Level SNC in upstate New York. Shout out Mike Moon. So this is a really nice one because you're also getting hip flexion of the other leg, right? And so we think about sprinting. You think about playing sports, sprinting, jumping, landing, your hip flexors right in front of your hips uh, are getting a lot of usage. So not a bad idea to also loop them in as a secondary uh, loading muscle, but this is a nice one. Again, it's it's using the hamstring curl position to rapidly lengthen and then pause and then reset while also getting the other the other hip to flex. You think about like sprinting. If you were to take my body and then kind of like rotate it forward, this is kind of like that sprinting position. So not a bad idea to load something like this. And then I think this last one is just having really specific intent. So I would recommend... So when we talk about training slow, think about like eccentric, slow, lower. Talk about training still, think about isometrics, like tendon health. People often forget, Erica, that there is a tendon. There are two tendons uh, in the hamstring, the proximal and the distal hamstring uh, tendon, which tendons, tendons respond really well to heavy, slow resistance. So think isometrics and eccentrics. That's why I think it's good to start there and then do some of that explosive, fast stuff. All right, that's super. Now, in terms of programming, uh, frequency, sets, and reps, let's just stick to what we would do in season because mm -hmm. at this point, yep. a lot of youth soccer players have soccer season pretty much year-round. So <laughs> let's do an in-season template. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so think of in-season. I always like to think about the approach of like, hey, how many days How many days a week are you playing soccer? And so they have to say, hey, well, I'm playing, you know, four total days a week. Okay, great. Um, whether they're practice or games or competition, to me, it's irrelevant. I'm, I'm just thinking like athlete exposures or AE in the research. Okay. I'm playing four days a week. Okay, great. Like on average, <clears throat> what's the total time you play each time? Oh, I play 90 minutes each time. Okay. 90 minutes times four. That's six hours. Okay. Six hours of soccer a week. I may be undershooting the volume here. Um, and, and please let me know if I am, but let's say you're playing six days a week. Okay. Realistically you, and I agree with you hundred percent, Erica, you absolutely should continue to strength train in season. Like that is the most important thing, whether it's once or twice, depending on time, but from a, from a, like a rep set standpoint, I always want to think of the volume that you're acquiring while playing the sport. And also think, when am I actually playing the sport? Um, Nicole Rodriguez has a lot of great content on this topic. Uh, she works, I believe with USA men's soccer now. Um, so does Nicole Sertica. I think she's with uh, Red Bull. She was with um, uh, women, women's professional soccer as well. So those are two names who, like in the soccer performance and rehab world, big time. So there's a lot of good information about when should we expose the athletes to strength training in the weight room. And if you look at Daniel Bowe's work in NBA, I know it's not soccer, um, where it's like, hey, if today is a high low day for the sport, whatever sport it is. It should also be a high low day for training for the sport. So I think if I'm playing soccer today, I'm playing the sport, I should probably high intensity load in the weight room for that sport as well. If tomorrow is a low load day in the sport, maybe you're in the in the room with your soccer players and you're just reviewing game film and doing some mobility yoga and stretching and breathing drills and some rehab. Okay. So if it's a low load day in the sport, it should probably be a low load day from a tensile strength standpoint as well. So that model has become really popularized in professional collegiate sports. And I think it should probably be the same at the youth, high, middle school, high school level as well, because what often we see is this level of burnout and this like this sport specificity. Like I'm, I'm just gonna play one sport. I'm gonna do it nine days a week. I'm gonna do it year round. And it's, it's it gets overdone. So that's an overarching theme. 
from a rep set standpoint, depending on how much volume the athlete is uh, undergoing, anywhere between two to four sets is plenty. So let's use an example because I want to get specific. So dumbbell RDL, so bilateral two leg RDLs. Maybe you're doing between two to four sets of eight to 12 reps. And I know that's very generalized, but it's intentional because it, you know, I want to make sure it's specific to a given situation. If you have an athlete saying, Hey, I'm playing a game tonight, um, you know, in a few hours, and I just need to get something in, two to three sets might be great. Whereas if they say, Hey, I'm, I got I got tomorrow all off and I'm not playing till Saturday because today's Thursday, you know, let's get three or four sets in. We can we can get a little bit more volume because you have tomorrow to recover. Because remember, if we're performing a lot of eccentric exercises that has more muscular damage that will last a bit longer. And if they're already going to be playing a sport that requires a lot of eccentric control of the hamstrings, like sprinting and stopping, that's a lot of volume. So I would approach it that way. When I program um, like a, like a, a loaded single leg deadlift or a single leg RDL, whether it's two hands with a dumbbell, whether it's dumbbell on the opposite side of the, of the stance leg, I like to stay between three and two to four sets of six to eight reps aside you certainly could do more. The problem that I see with doing more, at least long-term, is at a certain given point, you're fighting more stability than you're actually building strength. So if you're doing more than eight reps on that exercise, which it can be great for a beginner to challenge stability, but long-term, I want to challenge strength and stability and then get more strength out of it. This is where I think having a hand support at waist height is not an awful idea. If you're doing a single leg RDL or single leg deadlift, because if you're advanced and you're training it for a long time, maybe you just want to chase strength there. Maybe you get to three sets of five or six reps aside. Um, when you think about hamstring curls, whether you're performing the eccentric only or the full range of motion, same idea, like two to four sets, maybe you're in, you're in the ballpark of like eight to 12 reps. When we look at the last one, the Nordic, this is where we need to slow down a lot. Most people say, yeah, like do four sets of 10 in Nordic. So I'm like, that's a lot of eccentric overload. So when you think about the Nordic hamstring setup, with, again, where the knees were fixed, the ankles were fixed, you're just lowering. I like to start where the ankles are fixed, they're not moving. The knees are fixed, they're not moving. And your spine is tall, head to hips, I'm sorry, head to knees. And you lower down like maybe a couple inches and you pause. And you just hold that for five to 10 seconds, rest. That's one set. That's an overcut. That's an isometric exercise. That's a... Hey, like this is tough to control my core, my hips, my knees. Let's just work on the position itself. That's tougher than most people think it is. So maybe you do two to four sets of like a five or 10 second hold, plenty. When you advance that to the eccentric lowering, because traditionally a Nordic hamstring curl is full range of motions or down and up, um, that's a lot. I, I, would, I would recommend just doing the lowering. So we're doing the lowering, someone's uh, intermediate, they're not advanced yet. Maybe you do three to four sets of, you know, four to six reps at a three second lowering. That is beyond plenty of, of eccentric lowering. If they're playing the sport that day or tomorrow, you decrease the overall volume by taking off a set. So maybe you do two or three sets instead. That's really helpful for everyone. And yeah, again, there's a lot of thought behind it based on the athlete's practice and game schedule, which can get a little bit crazy nowadays. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I, I do want to just remind everyone that what we're talking about today is mainly for the the high school kids and up. So any like weight room exercise, I, I usually like to wait until after puberty uh, for my female athletes. And I guess people are wondering, well, what, what do you do for the hamstrings pre-puberty? I have a nine-year-old who wants to start strengthening hamstrings because you guys talked about the amazing benefits. So how does hamstring quote unquote training look different for the young ones? I love the question. Um, is it okay if I share screen real quick? Yeah. Okay. So this is an exercise. The research will call it like hamstring bridge long bridge like either way so it's it's so you're staying still it's an isometric okay oh, i hate these type of things apologies okay so i'm going to take this off okay so the most important thing and anyone can do this this is doable by anyone at any level so if we're talking youth like great great place to start all you need is yourself so I'm, my, my back's flat on the ground i'm going to bend my knees just a little bit okay as I do that, I'm going to bring my heels a little bit closer toward my butt. 
And from here, all I'm gonna do is I'm gonna drive the heels down hard into the floor. I'm gonna bring my hips up as high as I can. And while doing that, you're gonna get a lot of hamstring high and mid belly or middle of my hamstring in the top of it. A lot of like, hey, I feel my hamstrings here, right? So they're working. Maybe you hold it for five or 10 seconds. It's not meant to be extremely challenging. It's meant to teach the hamstrings, hey, we're gonna to begin to be using you more. So I want you to get ready for us using you at a higher clip. Very, very easy. Um, this is an exercise where I'll add in a warm-up for an athlete. Um, I'll put it in a hamstring set, like a set of training for the hamstrings in the program. So if it's in the warm-up, maybe 10 to 15 second hold. If you're training it like act, as an actual exercise, two to four sets of 10 to 15 seconds, plenty, 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 plenty. Do that for four weeks or a training block. Then I think once you've done this, that's when you can go back to what we talked about earlier, the hamstring lowering with the two sliders where you're just lengthening. Because notice it's the same position. It's the same setup. If, if this is too difficult, uh, everyone knows what like a bridge is. So if I'm flat on my back, my knees are bent, my feet are flat. Imagine my feet right here. And all I'm doing is bring my hips up and down. If I did that where I took my toes and put, pushed them off the ground, so my, only my heels are down, that could be another variation. So toes are up, heels are down, and I'm bringing my hips up and down to challenge the hamstrings. Then I'd come to here. But I have found... I have, I have not gotten to an athlete yet at any age or any, any level that said, hey, this is too challenging for me. This is a great entry point. Um, I just call it long bridge ISO. I think it's called um, hamstring bridge in the research. Um, this is where I like to get most of my athletes to begin, especially you mentioned the youth level. Yeah, that's great. And and those uh, isometric holds can be gamified in a sense and just have like the kids competing, like who can hold it the longest. Uh, yeah. we, we've done that with like single leg RDLs or like trying to like knock someone over. But I, I really like the use of just starting with the isometrics or body weight for the young ones. Now, what about sprinting? Because, you know, we could do all these strengthening exercises, but if we're not getting that speed exposure, it can be really tough to prepare the hamstrings for that. So is sprinting a hamstring exercise and how does that work? I had to learn this the hard way anecdotally through myself. I think you get to a point where you, you think about sprinting, right? And you have to ask yourself, well, there are explosive exercises we can do in the weight room, like hand cleans and kettlebell swings. Yes, correct. However, there is no exercise known to man or woman on this pla this planet earth that is the same intensity and speed as sprinting and that to me is if it's that important you should do it i don't know the like i know derek hansen has a, has a lot of good sprint work on like the 10 by 10 protocol i know lee taff talks a lot about like two two exposures a week um, i know nicole rodriguez has a really good um like sprint protocol like this is all for soccer my interpretation of sprinting is you should def if you're playing a sport, if you're playing soccer. I know there's sprinting in the sport of soccer, but you should definitely also sprint in training at least once a week to prepare those tissues, especially the hamstrings, for the actual um, movement of sprinting in the sport. And yes, I think it's an exercise you should be doing. When should be done? Well, warm up. Do you, do your you can warm up whether it's like mobility, flexibility type stuff. Adding in the sprinting before the lifting, whether that's with the plyometrics before or after is, is totally up to you. But before lifting weights, do the sprinting work. Volumes can be low. Distances can be low. I know everyone loves like fly-in sprints. So think of a fly-in for, for the viewers and listeners. Think of a fly-in as from zero to 10 yards. I am building up my speed from zero to 100%. Once I hit 10 yards for the next 10 to 15 yards, I am trying to sprint at maximum speed. So that's what you'll track. So that's called a fly-in sprint. It's usually a 10-yard fly-in and then a 10 to 15-yard actual sprint. Um, you could also do hill sprints. I'm a big fan of like, think of like 30 to 40% incline sprints. Again, 10, 15 yards, short distance, short volume. You don't need a lot to get it done. Most important thing with sprinting is maximal intent. I'm glad you brought up the difference between soccer sprinting within practices mm -hmm. and games and sprinting and training where athletes are actually re reaching top speeds and trying to get the fastest mile per hour they can get to really 
expose the hamstrings to that extreme type of training. So not only is it good for reducing injury, but you're going to get faster. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, you think of like, I remember when Usain Bolt, who at one point, I think he still has a record, fast, fast person in the world. They were like, hey, like what, what helped? Like all that strength training, like sure it helped like greater force development. He's like, well, if I want to sprint faster, I should probably sprint, <laughs> like do the obvious thing. <laughs> so. Yeah, I think there was just this thing in the strength coach world, even just like five years ago, I'd say everyone was like, oh, to get faster, we just need to get in the gym. And I'm like, yes, we do need to strengthen the muscles, but it <laughs> needs to be complemented with the speed training I would say also year round, at least once a week in season and getting that exposure. And I think it was Mike Boyle. He, he does at least two exposures a week, or, um, they do like one to two 10 meter flies within mm -hmm. their warm up, And it's just enough of a dose to get, um, an improvement in speed, but not enough to have an athlete like sore or going to practice tired. So, there are ways to do it. Totally. And to piggyback off of that, Tony Holler, uh, track and field coach, feed the cats. This is the whole model where I think Mike started learning from him and then it became popularized where I think you, you're right. One day a week is, is a high intensity exposure to sprinting, low volume. The other day a week is a little bit higher volume, lower intensity, like tempo runs or wicket runs. So just balancing those out two times a week, two exposures. If you're in season, even if it's just one time a week, but the kicker here is, doing it at least weekly, once a week, whether it's sprinting, strength training, like doing at least one of each once a week is the bare minimum, in my opinion. Um, because if you don't train something, you lose it. And you look at um, Andy Galpin, uh, recent research article came out like six, six to 10 months ago about the physical qualities you lose the most, right? Like, uh, like strength is, is the easiest to maintain aerobic capacity, a little bit harder, Power is a little bit harder. Speed is the number one thing you lose the quickest. I think it's like, I want to say it's, it's, it's within like seven to 10 days. If you don't sprint, you begin to like decrease. So I actually made, made it a point to my coach, Joe Aratari up in upstate New York. I want to sprint twice a week. I'm 35 now. Like I want, I don't want to become a NARP, right? An athletic regular person. I want to maintain something. And anecdotally, am I super fast as you saying, well, no, of course not, but I'm definitely faster than I was so because I'm sprinting. So I know it seems like too obvious, but if sprinting is important, definitely train at least once a week. I know which study you're talking about. And there's several others that say that even just like a one to two week cessation from sprint training, you, you lose it really fast. Yeah. So yeah, just a friendly reminder to keep doing your sprints. <laughs> totally, totally. Now, is there anything else on hamstrings? I feel like we covered a lot. <laughs> yeah, I think I think the most important thing is just hitting all positions, getting into exercises that get knee flexion, get hip extension, and get, and get combined throughout each week. So sometimes if you look at a training program, uh, folks will, or coaches will only do RDL variations. So like bilateral RDL, they'll do like cable pull throughs, they'll do um, single leg RDLs. Great. Those are amazing. Definitely do those. But also do your hamstring curls. Also do some variation of a Nordic. It can be isometric. It can be eccentric. So that you're touching all the hamstring functions and also sprinting. Like if, you, if you're doing all three positions of hamstring for strength training and doing variations of sprinting, whether it's high intensity, low volume, or vice versa, I think you're, you're checking off all the boxes for soccer players at youth, middle school, high school, college, pro levels at all levels. Great. So what we'll do here is in the caption, I'll include links to all the videos Matt just presented here and maybe a few extras and just some resources you can get on hamstrings and just programming and just to make sure you guys are staying strong and not getting hurt because there's a lot happening in the soccer world in terms of the hamstrings. So just want to make sure we're getting the education out there and, and you guys are all taking action. So Matt, thank you again. And I will see everyone on the next episode.